Welcome to Christ the King Sunday here at Jacksonville Presbyterian Church. If you would, please join me in our call to worship, which I've uh, adapted from Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. It is he that made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Please join in singing, all people that on earth do dwell. And now as is fitting for sinners, let us confess our sin in silent prayer to God. Let us pray. Amen. God does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our failings. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his constant love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. from the prophets this morning. This is from the prophet Ezekiel, the 34th chapter, beginning with the 11th verse. For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out as shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among their scattered sheep. So I will seek out my sheep I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. 
and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the watercourses and in all the inhabited parts of the land. I will feed them with good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pasture. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and they shall feed on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. And let me just interrupt uh, to point out there, you might notice that uh, uh, who it is that is called the shepherd of the sheep in the New Testament, that would of course be Jesus. Uh, you might notice the connection between this verse and that, where this says, God says, I myself will be the shepherd of the sheep. So when Jesus comes and says, I'm the good shepherd, he's telling us something about who he is. Verse 15 again. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. And from the Gospel of Matthew, 25th chapter, beginning with the 31st verse uh, and uh, again this is the this is the last Sunday of the Christian year of the Christian calendar uh, and so this will be our last text from the Gospel of Matthew we've been in the Gospel of Matthew this year Matthew 25 beginning with the 31st verse when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him then he will sit on the throne of his glory all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates sheep from goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Let me make a translational note here. The uh, Greek word that is translated here, members of my family, is adelphos. And adelphos can mean either a biological brother or a member of an intimate family-like group. We use the word the same way, right? Uh, a brother can be your biological brother or it can be your you know, brother in some group. Um, so in any case, the word can mean either here in Greek and it is being used here as it is throughout the New Testament to describe the followers of Jesus. We are brothers, uh, more accurately, brothers and sisters. We are members of the family of Christ. And the king will answer them, verse 40, and the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me, naked, and you did not give me clothing, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And then these will go away into eternal punishment but the righteous into eternal life. And then we have a reading from Philippians, Paul's letter to the Philippians, uh, the first chapter. Now the other two texts were lectionary texts for this morning. Uh, this one is not, it's a text I, I chose to go along with them and I chose it of course in part because it was a text we used in Bible study this week. 
right? So Philippians chapter 1, beginning with verse 27. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing, for he has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well, since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Be gather together to ask the Lord's blessing. He chastens and hastens his will to make known the wicked oppressing. Now cease from distressing. Sing praises to his name. He forgets not his own. Beside us to guide us, our God with us joining, ordaining, maintaining his kingdom divine. So from the beginning, the fight we were winning, the Lord was at our side. We've got a uh, message for the young people this morning. Um, Angela Hayes, Mrs. Hayes is with us this morning to bring us the message, so I'm gonna turn the pulpit over to Mrs. Hayes. Mrs. Hayes, nice to have you with us this morning. Uh, we haven't seen you in a while because of the uh, pandemic. Could you tell us how your family's doing? We are safely home. Uh, Jenny and Krieger are now my co-worker, so that's interesting in the background for my work calls, but luckily we get to stay home and we are safe and sound. Very good, and Krieger is? My dog, dog. my 104 pound dog. He put on some weight in quarantine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and uh, how old is Jenny these days? 20 months. Oh, getting up there, so she's pretty active, huh? Very. She climbs it all. Dave, <laughs> <laughs> can you come around this way more so she's, no, so she's looking at you more. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, and your family has enough money for home to live in and food to eat? We do. We go to Chick-fil-A a little bit too much, um, but we're very blessed to be able to afford everything we need. Um, but not all families have blessings, do they? Jesus says that if we ignore, ignore someone in need, we are ignoring him. And if we help someone in need, we are helping him. Mrs. Hayes has been working with a ministry called the Bridge of Hope, which helps women in need. Mrs. Hayes, could you tell us what Bridge of Hope does? Sure. So Bridge of Hope works with Christian communities to help end homelessness. So they'll help find mothers and children homes. Very good. Uh, recently, you participated in Sleeping Out for Bridge of Hope. Could you tell us what you did and why? Sure. So to help end homelessness, we had a fundraiser where we camped outside to feel as though we were homeless. It was scary. Um, I thought it would be a nice camping trip outside, uh, but being in the dark by yourself and exposed, uh, it was scary. And uh, how much money did you raise? I think around two hundred and fifty dollars. Right. Um, so that's what you raised on your own. Yes. You may not know that, but also another roughly four hundred dollars came in uh, through the church for your efforts. So total about six hundred dollars. Oh, that's great. And uh, could you? We thank you for coming this morning. And uh, could you say a prayer for us? Sure. Dear God, we thank you for all the blessings you give us: food, water, shelter, and your love. We pray for those who are less fortunate. May you guide us to help others and follow in your footsteps in life. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Abortion 
has been a frequently discussed issue at the pastor's group I attend focused on racial justice. It might seem, seem somewhat odd that a pastor's group focused on racial justice would spend a lot of time talking about abortion. I'll come back to that and offer some thoughts on how we Christians might go about approaching the issue of abortion. God, speaking through the prophet Ezekiel, says, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. God declares that God is going to rescue his weak, injured, and lost sheep while destroying the fat and strong sheep. The weak will get mercy. The strong will get justice. The weak are the common people of Israel. The fat and strong are their wealthy, corrupt leaders. This is a familiar critique of the leadership of Israel in the prophets. The leaders are enriching themselves at the expense of the common people. They will get justice. They will be destroyed, says God. You can hear echoes of Ezekiel and the other prophets in Jesus' parable of the sheep and goats. Jesus teaches this, then the king, that is himself, King Jesus, will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him. I'm summing up their response here. Lord, when did we see you like this? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Jesus says, Judgment will be based on how we treat the most vulnerable members of Jesus' family. We Christians are the brothers and sisters of Jesus. We are his family. And the teaching of Jesus here is that his future and final judgment will be based on how we Christians, on how we treat Christians, particularly the most vulnerable Christians. Notice that this is similar to what God, speaking through Ezekiel, taught. God would bring judgment on those who abused the people of God. In Ezekiel's case, the abusers were the leaders of the people of God. Paul offers a related teaching. Paul tells the Philippian Christians who are being persecuted, stand firm in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. In other words, the persecutors of Christians will fall under God's judgment for their abuse of Christians. The common theme in these three passages is that God cares about how God's people are treated. Judgment will be based on how God's people are treated, whether God's people are, is the Messiah, or his brothers and sisters. And that certainly means that God wants us, God's people, Christians, to treat each other well. We Christians are supposed to look after one another, particularly the most vulnerable members of the Christian family. And that brings us back to abortion. Personally, I have always considered abortion an important ethical issue. I've been on a March for Life in Washington, D.C. The March for Life is an annual event that protests abortion. I have been to my congressman's office to speak in opposition to abortion. I preach and teach on abortion. I think abortion is an important ethical issue. But I do not think that it is handled very well by the church, nor in American politics, nor in the intersection of the church and politics. 
When you are considering Christian ethical responsibilities, you have to distinguish between how we Christians are supposed to behave and then secondarily what we might ask of the larger communities in which we live. In other words, an issue like abortion is first an in-house Christian issue before it is an issue we might raise within American politics. For us Christians, I would argue that the children of Christians, both born and unborn, are members of the Christian family, and to harm them is to harm one of the least of these who are members of Jesus' family. What we Christians do to our children, born and unborn, we do to Jesus. I would therefore argue that with but a few exceptions, and there should be some exceptions, I would argue that abortion should not be a normal Christian practice. Research data from 2014, it was the most recent data I could find. The data reported that 54% of women who received abortions in the United States identified themselves as Christians, Catholics, mainline Protestants, and evangelical Protestants. The majority of those Christian women being in faith traditions that are opposed to abortion it looks to me like abortion is a problem within the Christian community, so maybe we don't have anything to say to the larger community, but I'm going to say something anyway. So to the politics of abortion, and back to my focused on racial justice pastors group, there are pastors in the group who claim that the one overwhelming issue, political issue, for Christians should be abortion. And therefore the key question for any political candidate is, are you opposed to abortion? These pastors claim that Christians should always vote for candidates who are opposed to abortion and will seek to appoint Supreme Court justices who will overturn Roe v. Wade. Roe v. Wade being, of course, the Supreme Court decision which basically says a woman has a right to an abortion under the Constitution's right to privacy. These pastors support the political right. There are other pastors in the group who disagree. They say that a majority of the women who receive abortions in the United States report a lack of financial resources as a key factor in the decision. And therefore the question to ask of political candidates is, do you support policies that will help mothers financially so that they won't have abortions? These pastors argue that the policies of the political left are more likely to help out financially strapped mothers-to-be and fathers, and so encourage them not to have abortions. These pastors tend to support the political left. Now, as I have watched our politicians in action, I've come to the conclusion that neither party wants abortion to go away. The politicians like having the abortion issue the way it is, divisive. It's a way to whip up their base. Politicians on the right like being able to say to their base, vote for me, I'll support Supreme Court justices that oppose abortions. Politicians on the left like to say to their base, vote for me, I'll support a woman's right to choose. And so while almost everyone agrees that reducing the number of abortions would be a good thing, and so while there are policies that would lower the abortion rate coming from both the left and the right, the politicians aren't about to work together to reduce the number of abortions. The politicians like the issue the way it is. And it would seem to me that this offers an opportunity for us as Christians. As Christians, we are committed first to Jesus and his family, and then to the well-being of everyone else, particularly the most vulnerable. Committed to Jesus, we hold secular organizations like political parties whose goal is always power and who are quite willing to manipulate the Christian community to that end, we Christians hold political parties at arm's length. 
Don't misunderstand, I'm not saying that as a Christian, you cannot be a member of and work within a political party. You certainly can, and in fact, I would encourage it. What I am saying is this, don't let a political party capture loyalty that belongs only to Jesus and to his family. And don't let party loyalty be a log in your eye while you point at that little speck in your neighbor's of the other party's eye. The opportunity we have as Christians is this, committed to Jesus and committed to each other, that's Paul's point in the passage we read from Philippians, we Christians should stick together and work together. Committed to Jesus and to each other, we should encourage the political right and left to work together to promote policies that protect children born and unborn and support their mothers and their fathers. You can't protect children without protecting their families. There are policies, some promoted by the political left and some promoted by the right that will protect children born and unborn and support their parents. As Christians, we should be encouraging the right and left to work together to protect the most vulnerable ones. And maybe we Christians should also get to work at cleaning up our own house. Maybe we should live our lives in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel. Let us pray. Our God, we thank you that you care for us, that you have made us part of your family. We know that your judgment will be based on how we treat you and your family. Help us to treat one another, particularly the most vulnerable in our midst, well. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And now if you would, please join in singing, Jesus shall reign where'er the sun. Jesus shall reign where the sun does its successive journeys run. His kingdom stretch from shore to shore till moon shall Send 
And now let us say what we believe as Christians using the words of the Servant's Creed, which was composed by our own Wes Kennedy. We believe we are God's called out people, saved at the cross of Christ, empowered to do good works by the Holy Spirit. We seek to follow our Lord Jesus Christ into a life of Holy Scripture direction, worship, prayer for ourselves, the church, our neighbors, and the world, material simplicity, service to the poor, the oppressed, the sojourner, the sick, the disabled, and all who need our help, care for the earth, evangelism, peacemaking. We seek a deeper conversation with God in our own lives, the church, and the world. Through this conversation, the world is being changed. To God be the glory. Amen. And uh, now let us come before our God in prayer as the people of God. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we have heard you teach that how it is your family is treated is the basis for your final judgment. We know we are to treat each other well. We are to work together to serve the ends of your gospel. We are to care for the most vulnerable people in our midst, particularly in the church, but also out in the world. Our God, you have cared for us. Help us to care for others. We live in a world where many are abused, where poor people are abused, where people who are different from the majority are abused, where people who are weak and helpless, like the unborn, like single mothers with children, where those sorts of people are abused. Lord, we live in a world that does not often take care of the vulnerable, but a world in which the rich and the strong prosper and are praised. And yet you have told us that on them will fall your judgment, our God. Help us to live faithfully, reaching out together in unity with the gospel of Jesus Christ to the very ends of the earth. Our God, we lift up to you this morning those in our midst who we know need your loving care in their lives. We pray for all of those among us who work and serve out in the world. We lift up Marissa, Warren and Georgia, Linda and Janice, Nick and Holly, Sandra and Ed, Loretta, Norman, Wanda and Lisa, Frank, Mary, Greg, Jane, Thomas, Danny and Tina, Jane's family and Jim, Kevin, Robert, Sue and John, Leon and Becky, Richard and Mary. We pray for Greg and Sandy Rue, Celeste Bercy, Tom and Nancy Dixon, Glenn Steele's family, Phyllis Kelty, Judy Ross, Eleanor Dunker. And Lord Jesus, help us to care for the least of these family members of yours. And now we pray to you in the words that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We did have uh, the Christian Caring Center folks in here this week, uh, putting together 150 bag lunches and uh, taking uh, lunches and food down to the Christian Caring Center. We want to thank all who uh, contributed to that effort um, as those who are helping the most vulnerable. Um, also, uh, want to thank Angela for being with us this morning, and I uh, want to thank all who participated in putting this worship service together. 
So that would be, uh, as I recall, Mary Ann and Wendy and Carl, uh, Jim, Kathy, and Angela. Thanks to all, oh, and uh, Kathy uh, Foran for our, for our drawing at the opening of worship. Thanks to all of them for contributing. Um, we appreciate uh, you sending in offerings to help us with the Christian Caring Center and with Bridges of Hope, and of course, to keep the church functioning. We appreciate that. And uh, let me send you on your way with a benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of you this day and forever. Amen. Go in the grace and the peace of God.